coming out this morning for uh, the Internet Shutdowns panel. My name is Kurt Opsahl. Uh, I do uh, cybersecurity and civil liberties policy work with the Filecoin Foundation. Been working around the uh, the Internet on tech policy for, uh, well, it's great to be here on the 25th anniversary. That's about as long as I've been uh, working on internet uh, Internet issues prior to uh, this I was working with, with these folks at the Electronic Frontier Foundation. Um, one of the reasons I was keen on, on doing this panel, as well as that uh, the Filecoin Foundation will work with the uh, IPFS, which is a peer-to-peer -peer file sharing network, and as we'll get into a little bit later, it has been used as an anti-censorship uh, 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 technique to get around internet bans and, and shutdowns. Um, and uh, yeah, we'll pass it on. Bill. Hey, uh, thanks, Kurt. I'm, I'm Bill Buddington. I'm a senior staff technologist at the Electronic Frontier Foundation, where I work on different technologies and um, looking at pieces of malware, seeing what they're doing, uh, reverse engineering common apps, too, that we all use and figuring out the privacy and security you know, policies or, or practices, rather, of those apps to see if they're doing what we think we're, they're doing. Um, so I, I, you know, I hope to get into a little bit maybe of not only internet shutdowns, but also internet fissures and how ways which, you know, some kind of uh, different internets can be created in different contexts, which kind of subverts this global notion of, of the internet. I am Starchy Grant. I work on the tech ops team at EFF. Um, we are responsible for EFF's internal systems and also a lot of the public facing systems that you might uh, might see from us and uh, even also running some of the uh, services that we uh, I think are going to be talking about uh, at this panel today. All right. Uh, well, so I was going to get us started with a little bit of uh, some of the background and, and history. So I'll, I'll go back to about 30 years ago when uh, John Gilmore, one of the founders of the Electronic Frontier Foundation, said uh, the net interprets censorship as damage and routes around it. Uh, and at the time, the, the internet was very uh, decentralized. Uh, it had a lot of uh, independent nodes, and this was a fairly true statement. It was, um, if you knock out any one of these nodes, there's still a path that the information can get through, and censorship was difficult to, to impose upon that, especially in comparison with the more traditional forms of media that were, were main forms of communication of the day, their broadcast networks. Uh, at the time, cable was was on, on the rise, which offered a lot more channels, but still there was a centralized cable provider that you could go to on those. Uh, a lot of newspapers had been bound together into large newspaper syndicates. Um, and these sort of older one-way media uh, were subject to uh, regulations, uh, especially in countries which did not have strong democratic uh, and uh, first uh, and or freedom of expression uh, principles uh, for the governments who were thinking uh, uh, to censor. But also at first, the, the internet was fairly niche. It was uh, you know, mostly academics who were using it uh, at first. Uh, you know, uh, uh, it was not uh, popularized until the, the mid-90s. Um, and uh, well, even in a country which has uh, some, some democratic traditions, there are still attempts to send it. One of the most major ones was uh, 1996, when the Communications Decency Act was, was uh, passed. This was a law that uh, attempted to make the uh, internet decent uh, and uh, as you can see, that was very successful. <laughs> uh, the, the law ended up uh, being uh, unconstitutional. Uh, went up to the Supreme Court, ACL versus Reno, uh, where the Supreme Court of the U.S. decided that indeed the First Amendment does apply to this new form of communication, uh, and uh, to, uh, therefore you could not require it to be decent. Um, though. Uh, uh, Nevertheless, their governments were still interested in uh, in, in controlling uh, this. It became more and more widely used by the by the mid two thousands. Uh, there was about a billion people on board, and then this starts getting way out of the the niche zone into something that can really have an have an effect. And so, for repressive governments, use of the internet was uh, potentially a threat. Uh, once a you know, citizen had a network connection, they could go and receive information uh, outside. They could, even if they could control all the sources of information locally, if they could get onto the net, 
that communications go outside to the world and start talking or getting information from sources outside the government's control. And they could also use the internet to uh, use platforms outside their control to communicate with, with each other. Um, and that especially came up during a time when there would be protests, where protesters might organize or say, wow, there was this ter terrible crackdown. Here's some pictures of the you know, uh, uh, shock troops coming to beat up the protesters, and that would incite more people to protest. And one of the places where this really sort of came to a head uh, was in the Arab Spring of around two, early 2010s, 2011 or so, which were a series of protests that uh, sort of spread around the North Africa and Middle East region, threatening the entrenched governments uh, and their hold on power. And images of the video, uh, the videos of these protests and their often very violent response by the governments uh, spread virally amongst the people and caused larger protests. And, spread to to other countries um, and this drew a, a strong response not just from the governments uh, coming after the protests directly but they're like this internet thing is is dangerous it took some some of Egypt Libya and Syria into full internet shutdowns um, we were discussing earlier this uh, Myanmar I think was the, the first, first one but this was one of the more early prominent ones uh, and uh, they the most of the other countries uh, did also internet controls, trying to use filtering or blocking technologies to like limit what people can do. So, uh, and an example is uh, Egypt was one of the first. The Egypt State Security Investigation Service uh, went through the sort of a cycle in, in, in very short order, a couple of days. So first they they decided to start blocking Twitter, where people were spreading a lot of the images about the. Uh, protests and so um, uh, so you could use the internet still but just could not access uh, Twitter um, and by the next day they found out that well people would just switched over to start doing it on Facebook so they blocked Facebook and people started switching over to a lot of, of other uh, services to to spread around uh, the messages they were trying to repress so by the by the third day uh, they went to shut down the internet and uh, this was a little easier for Egypt to do than it would be in, in some uh, jurisdictions because there are only a handful of licensed internet providers who could have the connection to the outside world. Uh, and so they could uh, did uh, call call them up and say, you better uh, turn off the, the spigot uh, for the, the connections outside of Egypt. So people could go uh, and get to an, an Egyptian site so long as the, the packet didn't, didn't leave the country. But if they were going outside, it was it was blocked in its entirety. And so uh, as I say, several other countries did uh, did the same. Um, and uh, uh, oh. another example, uh, a little, little bit later, just is a, a common uh, other technique would be to pick the site you really don't like, and then block that one uh, uh, in in particular. And uh, this can be accomplished through uh, to through a variety of means. Um, and one would be uh, filtering. Filtering would be to you know do deep packet inspection to see if particular words or things like that were in the uh, in the communications. Uh, at the time, most communications were over HTTP, so they were not encrypted. That made that relatively easy to do. Uh, these days, uh, almost all uh, communications are at least encrypted on the transport layer, and probably uh, uh, at least yeah, using HTTPS. Uh, and this makes it more difficult to use uh, filtering. Uh, another another technique would be blocking uh, through uh, uh, DNS. Uh, domain name service. So you say a, a particular uh, domain name is is bad and thus uh, either take it down by going after the uh, domain name provider, uh, the, the registrar to, to remove the domains. An example of that that, uh, that came up uh, uh, was in uh, Catalan. Catalan is a region of Spain uh, that has had a long tradition of uh, pushing for, for independence. And in 2017, they wanted to have a uh, referendum to get uh, the, the people's votes on whether to push for uh, in, independence from Spain. Spain 
very much did not like this uh, and uh, decided that that uh, having the vote was was unlawful. Catalan wanted to go ahead with it anyway. Uh, and so uh, Spain, amongst, amongst other uh, attempts to, to squelch that, uh, tried to stop people from getting information about the referendum and in particular where the voting locations were. These were hosted on uh, .cat, which is the Catalan uh, language uh, domain. Well, it's often used for, for uh, feline related content. It's actually uh, for the Catalan language. Uh, and so they raided uh, Punta Cat, which was the, uh, the, the registrar uh, that held us and required it to uh, take down the, the connections uh, to those, those domains so people couldn't find them. Um, and uh, uh, this is what I mentioned, uh, that, that IPFS protocol, uh, peer-to-peer uh, protocol, came, came into to play is that a mirror of this, the Catalan government made an IPFS thing. IPFS uses a system which is peer-to-peer -peer, uh, outside of the sort of regular web traffic channels uh, and uh, uses a, a content ID instead of an IP address to find the content. And so therefore, if you try to block it with uh, IP address blocking or DNS blocking, like this, this won't work. Uh, to make it easy for people to find, it uses a, a proxy uh, on the web. So you could block the proxy. This was a proxy based in the, in the UK. So you couldn't easily raid them to block it, but you could block outgoing connection to it. But it's easy enough to set a, another proxy up you know, within a, a few minutes uh, after the first one is blocked. Uh, so it, it made that information available in a, in a more censorship uh, uh, resistant uh, manner. Uh, and uh, another thing that, that came up in, in 2017, uh, so they the more targeted one, Turkey. Uh, Turkey uh, was upset with Wikipedia because there was a uh, Wikipedia uh, article that uh, uh, said that uh, Turkey was affiliated uh, with a, a supportive of terrorism as a sponsor for the uh, Islamic State in Al-Qaeda. Uh, Al Qaeda, and um, they said uh, that Wikipedia better better take this down, uh, or um, they would be blocked. And Wikipedia uh, did did not take it down, so uh, they ended up blocking uh, the access to Wikipedia throughout Turkey, uh, and that lasted from 2017 to 2020. Uh, during that time, there was litigation in the court. The Constitutional Court of Turkey eventually ruled that the uh, block of Wikipedia violated human rights. So that, that block was lifted. So uh, I'm also glad to see that at least there is some uh, rule of law left as a, as a technique to, to get around these, these kinds of blocks. Um, but nevertheless, and uh, my, my co-panelists will, will get more into some of the uh, circumvention uh, measures, but the Turkish people were not entirely unable to access uh, Wikipedia through a, through a variety of means. Uh, IPFS w was one of them, but also you could get onto uh, Wikipedia by using a, a VPN to get around the, uh, the block. Um, and uh, uh, there were so w widespread uh, techniques, though one of the things that was particularly scary at the time, and you know, just some of the, an illustration of some of the concerns that happened for human rights defenders is uh, also in, in 2017, some digital security trainers were uh, arrested in Istanbul uh, and uh, accused of, of using training to uh, uh, be against against the state. The charges were a little unclear, but it, it was, I think, alleged that they were involved with some of the supporters of the uh, coup against Erdogan that happened around that time. Uh, but it really that put a chill on uh, human rights defenders who wanted, or, or people who worked in the security space who wanted to help teach people some of these techniques. So just one thing to mount for the, these shutdowns is you know, state governments have a lot of tools at their disposal. And some of them will be technical tools like blocking uh, uh, access to the internet or to particular domains, but also they have the regular tools of, of governments to go and arrest people. Uh, so there's a lot more to say, but I'll, I'll, I'll think turn it over now to Billy. Uh, yeah, so um, thanks, Kurt, for the overview. And um, and I kind of want to go, go into some of the, I guess, structure of the internet and why it developed as it developed. 
like in, originally called the ARPANET. It was a series of networked computers over long distances um, that were set up via this kind of collaboration to uh, create standards around communication like IP, Internet Protocol, and, um, and uh, TCP, and, uh, uh, and these kind of technologies that were collaborative and um, very much kind of like centered on this kind of peer-to-peer -peer relationship between uh, university, the university system within the U.S. particularly. And as academic peers, any one of these computer systems could act as both a server and a client. And this kind of democratic principle pervaded um, throughout the late 70s, and the web only came about in, what is it, 93, I believe. But, you know, much before that, in the 1970s, 80s, um, this kind of network spread. And this is in stark contrast, as Kerr was alluding to, to the traditional means of broadcast communication, where you need an FCC license in order to and usually, you know, pay a license of maybe millions of dollars in order to uh, broadcast from some one central node to all the passive listeners that are uh, that are uh, picking out that broadcast. So from the onset, and as kind of Kurt mentioned this, this quote by John Gilmore about the um, you know, ability to route around uh, that, that you know, um, these particular you know, uh, nodes where if a one node goes down, then the internet kind of is able to use its uh, routing table to kind of figure out how to get around that one block um, is the power of, of the internet and that's how um, it's often very difficult for governments to shut down uh, large segments or within, you know, maybe they, they have uh, the ability to shut down their, you know, end providers, um, but it's often very difficult to. Um, so there's this kind of interesting uh, book that's uh, from counterculture to cyberculture and it kind of details how a lot of the spirit of the internet came from the counterculture of the 1960s plus academia plus um you know war resistors kind of leagues and things like that um to combine into what it is today um so we have uh this kind of ability for at first yeah you had um you know anchors that would say uh, that would would perhaps you know uh, be uh, at uh, NBC or, or ABC, and they say, "Yes, my email address is uh, Bill at uh, you know uh, NBC Disney com." And then they kind of like you know those those central they got their own domains. But then you know there were a number of uh, these independent blogs that started. Uh, hey, well, it yeah, back in the day, CompuServe. Wow, <laughs> CompuServe in a very long time, uh, but. Um, yeah, so so you know one uh, prominent example of a a uh, service that was a kind of proto blogging service was Active SF. Active SF. This was a um, software that was running uh, for the Independent Media Center. Who have, has heard of the IMC Independent Independent Media Center? A few of you, yeah. So this was uh, a blog software that was created by activists after the World Trade Summit, uh, or sorry, the World Trade Organization's conference in Seattle in 1999, November 1999. And out of that came this kind of collaboration. We can actually get our independent news out rather than relying on centralized news services um, get our independent news out by hosting our own kind of blogs. This is kind of like very proto blogging software that uh, use, I think, CGI or something. Um, and then, um, you know, uh, you had that proliferate and you have, you know, today micro blogging services uh, like X. Um, <laughs> And uh, you know uh, the Fediverse and a lot of other kind of um, technologies that that had and see this kind of thing where within the internet you have centralization happening uh, in and of itself, and then um, you know you, you kind of had this in terms of microblogging, this dispersal of 
of that centralization. But, but we're not here to talk about that so much as, as internet shutdowns, right? And, and some of the circumvention techniques that you can use to circumvent the shutdowns um, where, uh, you know, you, one you might think of and you'd be right to think of is Tor. Um, this is the anonymity uh, network Tor, where uh, you uh, are able to connect to the Tor network, and it's set up so that you connect through three different Tor nodes before you get to your final the final destination that you're trying to say web browse. Um, in this way, you uh, the site that you're visiting does not know what your IP address is. And if you're using Tor browser, it doesn't know about your, your normal browser characteristics. Um, one of the things that we develop at, at EFF is called uh, Cover Your Tracks. And uh, it details how, much, how identifiable you are based on just your browser characteristics, absent cookies. Um, so Tor browser does this great thing where it, uh, it uh, removes that kind of fingerprintable characteristics from your browser because you're using Tor browser. Uh, and you look like everybody else in the Tor network. Um, so, so Tor kind of scrambles your connection and makes it so that the website doesn't know, you know, what your IP address and is, and your ISP doesn't know, you know, that you're accessing those sites either. Um, and so there's this uh, ability for you to be anonymous on the web. It also has the side effect almost of circumvention of censorship because you're accessing these Tor nodes that are outside of, you know, say there's a uh, censorship um, technique that relies on DNS blocking. So the DNS requests go through the Tor network and they don't go through the normal DNS service that um, is, is uh, you know, usually used when accessing any given site. Um, so just using the Tor network, you get this side benefit of censorship circumvention. Um, a lot of countries block Tor. And they block Tor because it has this property. <laughs> they block Tor because it gives users anonymity. Um, and to that kind of particular technique of blocking Tor itself, the Tor network has also provided these what's called bridge nodes, which are kind of communicated to uh, say you're someone in a censorious regime, um, then I, uh, if I'm able to get into contact with you and let you know about a Tor bridge on a specific IP address with a specific uh, access code, then you can still access the Tor network as your kind of first hop. Um, as the as the entry node, it's called. Um, it's basically your entry into the Tor network, um, and and this this kind of entry into the Tor network from your censored location is kind of given to you in a hush hush manner, and then you're able to access the Tor network and and uh, subvert censorship. Um, you know the level of censorship that you encounter is very much based on the cultural context of the country that you are in. Um, for instance, it's not uncommon for uh, those within uh, mainland China to access VPNs. And it's kind of, if you're in a, of a certain social status and, and uh, class status, um, frankly, then you're able to access VPNs outside of the country pretty easily. Um, however, in other regimes, it's more restricted, um, so like North Korea, for instance. So um, there's kind of a, a very kind of specific censorship techniques that are used. But a lot of these censorship technologies are not developed within censorship regimes. They're developed here in the U.S. Uh, you know, there's a lot of firewall software that is developed within the US. There's um, companies that make it, that ha don't have any qualms with selling uh, hardware that makes it easier to uh, censor the internet. Um, you know, uh, there's many Cisco routers that, that are uh, very specifically uh, have a capability of blocking large swaths. Um, so 
the technologies themselves are pretty agnostic to the fact that you're censoring entire, you know, swaths of the internet. But um, but they are you know involved within non censorious regimes, um, so that's kind of important to keep in mind and and to urge companies not to sell to uh, countries that that do this. Um, another kind of thing that we wanted to bring up was was you know the capability of what when you have a full internet shut down uh, where you can't even access uh, your your internet service provider then there have been clever techniques that citizens have come up with to communicate between devices on a peer-to-peer street-level basis. This is called a sneaker net. Um, and sneaker nets are your ability to tap somebody else's phone and get the entire log of a communication system. Um, and so, oh, this is something, I got the latest, um, you know, 1,500 messages and say only... Um, seven of those messages out of the 1500 are encrypted encrypted to a key that I myself have. And so I'm able to see the messages that are encrypted to me, but no one else's messages, right? So so this is kind of how a sneaker net might work. And there are sneaker net technologies. There's um, one called Briar, which is B-R-I-A-R, which is used... Um, there's others out there that have been used to to some success or not. Nah, you know the the kind of uh, s- you know circumvention of censorship. Um, a lot of the time relies on you not being detected because you know, a lot of the time when you're operating within censorship or c- censored uh, contexts, then you're operating also within a uh, a repressive regime, and you really don't want to get caught using these things. Um, so, so, uh, you know, there's also things like, um, Starlink and Starlink being, uh, not dependent on, um, terrestrial infrastructure as, as much as, you know, you just need basically a, um, connection, of you know, a, uh, or, you know, not just Starlink and there's other, there's other, uh, geosynchronous orbit, uh, like, a, a Viasat or HughesNet, those kind of. Uh, are also uh, options, but um, and those companies allow you to not be dependent on terrestrial infrastructure within that particular country. Um, for HughesNet and Viasat, you just point to that specific area of the sky. For um, for uh, Starlink, you just you know plug it in and it kind of figures out where to point itself. Um, and those are not the 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 beam of those are attenuated enough that it's not detectable that you're using them uh from the from unless there's like you know some some um you know uh video surveillance um then they can you know see that you're using a satellite or something like that but it's not detectable from within like an entire region of like oh here are the 20 people that are using you know uh and you know for for instance uh starlink was deployed in the context of ukraine um where uh you know uh they can there there were you know infrastructure wars going on and uh, and the infrastructure was blocked uh, by Russian attacks and Ukrainian uh, 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 military was able to use Starlink um, and then there was this weird fight within with with Starlink too I guess I don't know there was some Elon Musk drama shit too but um. <laughs> But yeah, but but they did use it to some extent, success as well. Um, so, so yeah, there, there's some kind of technologies to kind of um, to, to to subvert some of those censorship techniques. Thanks. Yeah. So, uh, just a, a few things that I'd like to expand on. Um, Bill uh, talked about how you can run a tour bridge to help people get online if they're in a country that is blocking access to Tor. Um, It's actually, it's gotten even easier than that. Uh, Tor has a new technology called pluggable transports, which uh, basically disguises Tor traffic so that it looks more like regular web traffic or another common internet service. And that is super easy to run a bridge. Uh, It 
all you have to do is uh, install a browser plugin and leave it running in the background. Uh, you can look for the Tor Snowflake plugin. and Not to be confused with the Snowflake data breaches. Different company. Different, yes. Um, and yeah, uh, you can just leave that running and help people get online. It's uh, remarkably easy. Um, and then I wanted to give a little bit more context for those sort of total internet shutdowns that uh, that Kurt was talking about earlier. Uh, for anyone who's, who's keeping notes, we saw some, some really interesting ones uh, both before and since uh, the Arab Spring. Uh, the first ones that I know about were in uh, places like Nepal, Myanmar, and the Xinjiang province of China, which I'm probably saying wrong. Um, and that that's all, um, particularly those last two, that's, that's um, especially disturbing, right? Those are places where we've seen not just repression, but uh, outright genocide or, or um, you know, claims of genocide, uh, I should say, because I'm not a lawyer and uh, I don't want Kurt to smack me. Um, and uh, uh, since then, uh, we've seen a, a number of similarly very interesting uses of uh, these, these total shutdowns. We've seen them in places like uh, like Palestine, Sudan, uh, very recently in Bangladesh during the, uh, the amazingly successful student uprising. Um, We've also seen them uh, only once fully documented in the United States, um, and that was that was uh, believe it or not right down the street from the EFF offices in San Francisco, on uh, on our subway system BART uh, during um, protests against a, uh, a police shooting in 2011. Um, we see them frequently um, across the globe during national exams. Uh, it's a very heavy-handed approach to try to prevent student cheating. Um, this, this seems uh, much more difficult and uh, less cost-effective than keeping proctors in the room, but this is what, uh, what some governments prefer to do. Um, so, yeah, uh, the, these these approaches tend to go hand in hand with with repression uh, and sometimes worse, sometimes uh, war crimes and crimes against humanity. Um, so uh, finding ways around them can be very important. Um, we talked about Tor. Uh, another thing that's come up recently is um, if you are familiar with the signal. Uh, Signal Messenger, um, that is a very important uh, service for private uh, messaging. It's it's really you know the, the best of breed for keeping your messages private and secure. They've also seen national level blocks in a few nations recently, and uh, that is another service that you can run your own uh, proxy for to help people access it if they are in one of those nations. Uh, they have a great blog post uh, taking you through that step by step. Um, I, I have a lot of experience with running servers and those kinds of services, so it probably won't help too much if I tell you it only took me a few minutes. But uh, I, I do think it's pretty easy if you have a, a little bit of experience with those sorts of things. Um, and then if you have a lot of experience with Things like software engineering and network engineering. Uh, maybe check out uh, projects like Meshtastic or other mesh networking projects to help people do peer-to-peer uh, -peer networking uh, so that during emergencies, protests, um, you know, or these kinds of nationwide shutdowns, uh, people can keep their devices talking to each other, uh, keep their neighborhoods and their communities informed. Um, should, we, should we go to questions? All right, well, I was, I was gonna try and um, tie some things together and then we, yeah, we take your questions uh, uh, coming up uh, momentarily. 
but just sort of try and try some of say you know many governments are are concerned about what you know what kind of con- uh, conversations are having in their country that may be against what they're what they're looking for uh, in terms of their uh, public positions on things giving people information that may rile them up or such and a lot of times uh, you know these uh, blocking or shutdowns are around either protests or you know an election or some moment of uh, uh, where a lot of people might be activists and uh, sending around messages and the promotion of that um, to put in some some of these circumvention measures and into a, sort of a larger context when I, I introduce the uh, the cute cat theory uh, I came up with uh, and which is that uh, you know people a lot of people what do they want to use the internet for well it's to to look at you know, pictures online, happy, fun things like uh, cute cats, many other things ha- as well. But if your activists if, are, are using the same networks where people are getting the pictures of cute cats, if the government shuts it down, it poses a cost on, on the government because there are a lot of people who are not activists, who are not, you know, uh, the, who they're against, who will now be upset because they can't get access to to the internet. So this in- incentivizes governments to to try to go after and you know just try and stop the communications from those that uh, they're they're targeting, and by uh, using circumvention techniques which make your traffic go amongst uh, all, all the other traffics and these things, you make it harder or more costly for the, for the government to shut down the communications. And when they do a total shutdown, that means they like not only are they shutting down the the opposition that they're they're trying to get to but you know, everybody can't use the internet for any purpose and this creates more unrest so that that puts some pressure to turn the internet back on keep it at least t- temporary and try to resolve these tensions uh there there are also some some uh, workarounds for that like you've probably heard of the great firewall of, of china uh, which tries to put this wall around the, the, the entire country of China, uh, but they've also put tremendous effort into replicating a lot of these services for, for social media with Chinese companies that uh, they are subject to Chinese government control so that people can get access to the internet. They just can't uh, say anything that would be going against the, the censorship rules. So that, that sort of illustrates another sort of larger point is that centralization uh, is one of the uh, the techniques. And in some countries, this is because uh, the, the relevant companies are either owned by or controlled by uh, the government. And there's only uh, a handful of them making it a sort of one-stop shop to, to go and say, okay, this kind of contact. No longer can you say Winnie the Pooh on the Chinese network because Winnie the Pooh became a, a uh, means of criticizing the uh, presidency. So uh, having decentralization can be, I think this is not to say that that uh, each of the nodes of a decentralized network aren't subject to uh, whatever jurisdiction that they are in, but they are spread out often uh, globally around other jurisdictions and many of them may be in ones which have more uh, uh, Thoughts about human rights and and uh, be willing to defend that, uh, and you still have to go after them sort of individually, and so it gets us closer to getting sort of back to that notion uh, of the internet interpreting censorship of damage and routing around it, but where it has to, has to all be routed through one centralized company uh, or centralized service, then it's then it's easier to to do. And some of these things may be maybe a trade-off. If you are going to sort of maximize uh, being able to communicate in a method that the government might be uh, get the whole population upset, then you might need to use a centralized uh, service until the decentralized services become popular enough that they are not unusual or not you know uh, easy to block. Uh, this is where you know best if we can. Move away from having centralized services be the most popular and used ones. Uh, so uh, we have. Oh, well, I did want to kind of like add to that yeah, too. Please. The, um, just before uh, open up to questions, that this is kind of why also HTTPS is so important, right? So with with HTTPS, uh, you are if you are a ISP within a country, then you're usually able to, uh, unless you're using a specific technology, you're able to. 
see what domain someone is accessing, but not what they're accessing on that domain in HTTPS. So um, there's a technique called domain fronting, uh, where a large site might put up a service that is that offers a communication service a way to channel through that large site in order to get that communication out. Um, and this is something that Tor has used in order to uh, circumvent censorship um, because in order for uh, a country like, um, you know, say Kazakhstan to block, you know, uh, signal or block uh, Tor, then they would have to take down New York Times.net in the entirety of, or Twitter.com or something that is large and costly to take down. Um, that will cause a lot more upset than they're uh, trying to prevent. Um, so a lot of countries are not willing to do that. And I guess I'll you know stop on that final point where this is kind of where some of the dangers come in when there is a non-global internet. There's a regional kind of internet services that you know, instead of China, most of China using um, most you know, the common messaging services that we use, they'll use QQ uh, a lot instead, uh, or microblogging uh, via, uh, or, you know, Baidu and, and other services that have been developed, you know, that aren't kind of uh, the global standards, but they're mostly specifically for China, so that it's easy to block. Because so so many uh, Chinese citizens are, you know, reliant on those uh, internal services rather than the ones that uh, are hosted outside. So it's easier to control um, and easier to block if if something is is um, being being done that 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 the Chinese authorities don't like. So um, so yeah, there's this kind of technique of domain fronting, but but the danger here is that we have this kind of uh, what's called balkanization of the internet, um, this, this um, you know, mini internets forming within specific jurisdictions that are able to be blocked or more easily censored. Um, so yeah, that's, that's you know, one of the, the ongoing kind of threats that, that uh, I see and kind of threatens this kind of global um, cooperative internet structure that we all know and love. So uh, there's a mic there in the center. So if you have any any questions, can line up, uh, Mike, and we're happy to uh, to answer them. Fortunately, we'd never see that kind of issue here in the United States as long as you're not hoping to keep using TikTok. Mm -hmm. So uh, tech, can you hear me? Tech, politics, society, activism. Uh, you, you guys have focused a lot on the tech side of, of the issue so far and based on your backgrounds. Um, and so everybody in like this room knows, uh, like on the cyber side, if you're the target of a nation state, then there's almost nothing you can do. If you as an individual are the target of a nation state, there's almost nothing you can do. Um, there's just too much out there now. Um, so you guys have framed a lot of this uh, in terms of activism within these countries. Is there a little nuance in terms of nation states in the information space acting within your country? So thinking misinformation, disinformation, automation technologies, um, machine learning, like all these technologies are getting more exquisite and they're getting more automated and they're getting more effective. Uh, so in terms of other non-liberal nations targeting more liberal societies, they don't have a right to use our roads when, when for their military. Why would we let them use our, our networks? So is, that, is there a little bit of nuance there? And, and where is that line? All right. Well, that raises uh, actually a, a number of things, and so uh, you know, if, if you are targeted uh, certainly by a, a major uh, nation state, uh, you're in a bad way, uh, and you know that's. Uh, but it's also difficult for them, you know, to target everybody. Like, there's a difference between mass surveillance and targeted surveillance, and you know, the the. Uh, Best protection against targeted surveillance is that make it so it's very hard uh, to surveil everybody, and so that has to require special effort, and they really have to care about somebody to go after them. So, like, if, if they have to use 
a uh, O-day, a zero-day, you know, uh, exploit to get onto your phone because of a fully patched, you know, well, well-protected phone. They're going to spend a couple million dollars to buy that that exploit. If they use it, there's a risk that it will be discovered by like the fine people at Citizen Lab, for example, and then you know, you 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 becomes expensive. But if you're worth a couple million dollars to go after, then you know, you're 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 gotten. Um, you're also thinking like, you know, sh shouldn't we, uh, sort of, uh, I think, uh, uh, a very different question, uh, which is, you know, uh, uh, with other nation states using U.S. based networks. Um, and uh, one of the one of the things is the well, NSA. Maybe, maybe partners. Yeah, sure. Of other countries, because that's. Yeah. yeah. So. Uh, Bangladesh. Right. So one of the things to just put uh, uh, maybe a, a piece of perspective or you see nuance on that. So that you know, most internet traffic worldwide goes through the United States. They, they take the fastest route, not the shortest route. So if you have a, a packet who's going from uh, a Africa to South America, you know, it doesn't cross the South Atlantic. It goes to the United States and then goes back, back out again uh, because that's where the, the fast pipes are. Uh, this has been considered by the U.S. government to be a huge strategic advantage, and uh, they, for the uh, national security agencies, uh, spying uh, uh, a foreign intelligence mission, uh, putting sniffers on on that uh, on that traffic, was considered to be a boon. This was the sort of the heart of the uh nsa surveillance program that got into uh, full swing uh after uh 9-11 called stellar wind uh, for a while uh that eff spent uh, spent many years uh suing the nsa over for its uh, uh un unconstitutionality uh but uh, uh at least from the from the point of views of the government to having having that go through your your having foreign traffic go through your systems gives you abilities to surveil and to institute some controls. As far as content controls, that's a little bit more, more challenging if you are a, uh, a government with a, a, a commitment to freedom of expression uh, and uh, uh, you know, rule of law. You also have to consider that your citizens have a right to read, a right to receive information of their, of their choosing. So if you start to block uh, foreign nation states who you feel are doing uh, misinformation or, or bad acts that comes into tension with with a, a right to uh, to read which would be uh, difficult to justify within uh, a system of free expression so it may come to a point to do what you're you're describing that a uh, liberal democracy would have to give up its values in order to protect itself against this sort of thing and then that that certainly begs the question is you know do you become the enemy in order to fight them and, and, yeah i'd say it's also worth considering that this isn't a one-way flow uh that the us and our partners certainly do also uh, perform the same kind of, uh, let's say, content injection or whatever you would you, like to call it, uh, in nations you know, in their uh, in their uh, social media and their other fora um, with messages that we want to get across. As recently as as last week, uh, there was a story about the U.S. military uh, putting content on Tinder in Lebanon, for example. So, uh, so it, it, that that is also a question of, you know, international norms and not necessarily uh, the, the same kind of idea of uh, whether individual citizens are are or uh, social movements are being uh, repressed in in the way that I think we were talking about, but. Please let me know if I've misunderstood your question. I think you understand it fully. Okay, thank you. My question is about the Tor Bridge. I wasn't sure if it was addressed already because I came a little late. But my question is, if I set up a bridge, do I need to worry about illegal traffic? Generally, 
setting up a so uh, you uh, when you set up a middle node or an entry node then no so you need to be very specific uh, about okay i want to set up a node on the tor network um that's um within that so basically okay the tor network is three separate <laughs> nodes and then there's there's an entry node which is often called a guard node um and then there's a middle node and then there's an exit node that exits your traffic th to whatever destination it's going to um so if you are worried about the legal implications of uh your traffic um you know uh, uh or your a computer that you set up being used for legal purposes then you can uh, configure the servers to not be an exit node, to not to you know um, actually have that your the traffic exiting through a computer system that you own or use. Um, there is a technology developed by the Tor project in general called Exonerate Tor. Uh, um, basically, if you it can it's for law enforcement to be able to say, hey, I saw this IP and it was at this time, Is it was it running a Tor exit node? And it'll tell you yes or no. Um, and that way uh, you can, uh, basically anyone that's running a Tor exit node um, that has someone doing illegal stuff on it um, and using it uh, will, uh, it'll, uh, make sure that the person running the Tor node isn't legally liable for what went on um, by others that are, that use that um, that Tor exit node. There, there are also, oh, sorry. There, there are frequently uh, local projects at places like uh, hacker spaces, maker spaces uh, that will even go as far as forming their own nonprofit boards to run um, Tor exit nodes. And one uh, side effect of this is they end up getting to know local law enforcement and local law enforcement ends up having a better understanding of how exit nodes work and and uh, what you know what not to watch out for in a sense yeah just to add on to that uh, uh, briefly is that uh, you know exit nodes is something that that you know runs the the kind of concerns that you were uh, is also an extraordinarily useful thing to have exit nodes on on the network, but balancing out between those concerns, yeah, I think yeah, working with uh, donating to an organization that will run an exit node for you, right? That helps because then they're they're taking on on that burden they better set for it, or doing it on your own at least do it somewhere else, like you know have a, a your exit node at a data center which is just used for an exit node, like. Don't run it out of your house. So if something does come up, it's not that they're coming back to your house and thinking that you did the bad thing. Um, and law enforcement, at least in the in the U.S., has I guess you know those who work in in uh, the cybers have an understanding of, of of Tor for a while. There was a uh, particular FBI uh, guy that I got to know who was the one who you could call up and say, "Hey, they're they're." came by to an hour, you know, asked some questions of this exit node. Could you explain to your colleagues what an exit node is? And, and he, would, he would do that. Uh, but now many, many of them know. But keeping it separate from your personal life uh, is, a, is a good good thing to do. And there are ways that you can support exit nodes without doing it where it will impact you directly by running it out of your house. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Hi. Uh, Quick question, with Meta's movement now towards end-to-end -end encryption, how does that impact what we're going to see abroad relative to, um, you know, to governments trying to, to stop, you know, trying to censor things? So I believe that Facebook Messenger's default is still not encrypted, if, correct me if I'm wrong. Um, and then... They're rolling it out. That's it. Yeah? Okay, okay. Yeah, they're rolling uh, Great. Um, so... Uh, we believe that the defaults that Signal uses are safer than a lot of other messaging apps. We believe that the rollout of end-to-end -end encryption on various messengers is a great and positive thing. Um, but 
you have to kind of, uh, for instance, on WhatsApp, you have to change the defaults um, in order for your messages not to be backed up to iCloud, uh, your interlocutor's messages not to be locked up, to, to be uh, uh, you know, uh, also transmitted to iCloud. Um, the great thing about this signal is kind of that as a private messenger, it you're using it for communicating privately. That's the main use case. They're not going to sacrifice the security of the app for its um, presumed for its usability, but actually it's a pretty fucking usable app now. It's like, it's got <laughs> fucking stickers and shit. I mean, like, um, so I, you know, I think that, um, what about Facebook, which is so ubiquitous, everybody uses Facebook and, you know, X, Y, Z. So it's not unusual for them to be on. And when that goes to fully encrypted, it's going to add another dimension into so, the ability to censor or stop. Yeah, so this, this I think, is good. We're, we're running, running towards the end of time here. So uh, I'll use this as a, as a way to sort of wrap up some of the, some of the things. So, uh, so Messenger uh, is used by like a billion, you know, plus right. people, right? It is an extraordinarily well, you know, popular uh, thing. And by moving it to uh, encrypted, it means that you can't do the kinds of uh, surveillance, packet sniffing, you know, information about it. If it's end to end encrypted, like it is, uh, you can't go to Facebook and say, give it to me. Uh, so what this means sort of in the context of this censorship uh, and shutdowns, is that it's therefore uh, if you're really worried as a, as a country that messenger is being used to uh, by, by activists by opposition figures by anybody to uh, your your choices are now you know a shutdown of Facebook becomes one of the options that you might not have considered before because you can't do that sort of the, the granular right. thing on the other hand a shutdown of Facebook messenger which is used by by billions of people will impact your country and your populace a lot more than shutting down signal right and also something that gets your you know your your uh, come under physical scrutiny by by the authorities of that country and you have messenger on your phone this is in no way weird or a sign that you are a troublemaker uh and so in some countries it actually even though signal has i think uh, bill's right it's a wonderful thing it's a, a, a probably a better tool but it is not used widely enough that it, it's not maybe a bit weird to have it on your phone in a way that it, you might not want to seem weird uh, when you're having a in-person interaction. It means so, it's intentional that you want yeah. your communications encrypted. Yeah, and so by this, this is so it it really hits on that that like maximizing protection against mass surveillance and maximizing protection by having it so that the messages that they want to censor are intermingled in an indistinguishable way with billions of other messages. So that that makes it harder to to do these kinds of blocking and tracking, but it also means that some countries will be more and more tempted to shut down a service, or if, if that doesn't work, shut down the entirety of the internet. So one of the reasons, perhaps, that we're seeing more and more of these total shutdowns is because the governments are, are making a choice that they can't successfully block the, just the things that they don't want to have, and they're willing to pay that high price of everyone being upset by doing a, a shutdown. Uh, which is is very unfortunate. And, uh, you know, we want we want people to to keep it on. Uh, and they can keep it on. Also, just a shout out to Access Now, who's been been following this for for a lot of years and has been documenting it. Uh, the, the the cover uh, uh, for this uh, you know, the, the description of this session was talking about the 2022 numbers. The 2023 numbers were up, uh, I think, 41 percent of the number of shutdowns and. So I think a record uh, number of countries, and you know, 2024 we'll get the stats at the end of the year, but it's it's increasing. Uh, and there are organizations as well called like the Keep It On Coalition that keeps track of that. So I just want to give a shout out to them as well. So thank you for your question. Thank you all for coming. And uh, that's a wrap. <laughs>